get you to turn with me to the book of uh, uh, Genesis chapter number 29 and verse number 13. Genesis 29 and 13, verse 13. The scripture said, It came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. And he told Laban all these things. Lord, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. Now, Rebecca was Laban's sister. And, of course, you know the story of Jacob. He was a usurper from birth. And he's about to meet someone who's about to uh, teach him some lessons. He's going to learn some real lessons about deceit. You notice the scripture says that Laban ran and kissed him. He welcomed him into his home, showed him uh, love. But you understand now that Laban was his uncle. And uh, he was about to use him in every sense that he could. Although on the surface he presented himself as a as a family member and somebody who loved him and wanted to bring him into the family. Uh, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 5, The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. And deceit is one of the worst things there is. Because when you're deceived, you don't know it. That's like blind religion. They don't know they're blind. In John 9, they said, are we blind also? The Lord Jesus Christ told them exactly what it meant to be blind. But there's a play on words here. The name Laban, when you look at it, do the etymology on it, you'll find out that it literally means white, means pure. And you've heard of Lebanon, haven't you? You know about Lebanon. Well, that's associated with Laban. They, say, they came from the same source. And uh, Lebanon has a mountain. It's called Mount Hermon. And today, if you look at what's going on in Israel, you'll find that they go to Hermon and they ski. They snow ski because it's the highest point around. You can go there in June, and we have, and you can see the snow on the top of Mount Hermon. Hermon means separated, untouchable, above, beyond reproach. That's quite the thing. Look that up when you get home and you have a little time. And there's something else that Hermon is important for. And that is that the waters of Hermon melt. And they flow down to the south. And they rise bubbling up at Banias. And that is where the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? It was at Banias. As this water bubbles up, it begins to form what's known as the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows all the way to the south until it comes to what's called the Dead Sea. A river in the Bible is a good indication of life itself, especially the life of a man. If you notice that as this water leaves Hermon, which is untouchable, which is beautiful, which is covered with snow, which is high, it flows south. And the further it flows, the closer to death it gets. So to leave that mountain and to leave the untouchable to leave the place of glory, to lead the play, leave the place of the abode of God, leads to nothing but death. And so every time they cross the Jordan River, it's symbolic of something. It teaches a lesson, a great lesson to be taught and to learn. The Lord Jesus Christ went into the Jordan River. He went into the place of death, and he came out of it. My friend, there's a great lesson in that for us tonight. If we flow away from God, we're flowing toward death. We need to return to the one who gave us life. You see, we started with him. All life comes from God. It does not originate on this thing. It's nowhere else to be found. I know, they're, I know they're breaking their back to try to find life out there somewhere. It's not out there. It's right here. It's here that God settles the issue of sin. And so here on this planet, God deals with it. So this is the kiss of a deception. Have you ever had anybody treat you like that? Come across as a friend? And then you find out that they are a backstabber. That's the worst kind of all. In Genesis chapter number 45 and verse number 4, we have the kiss of love, though. This is real love. Genesis 45, 4, the Bible said, And Joseph said to his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Boy, what a rebuke. What a rebuke to them. 
reminded them. I'm sure it didn't have to remind them. It was fresh in their memory. Crying out of their young brother. And they sold him into slavery. And of course it was all done because they were jealous of him. That was the, mo that was the greatest motivating factor. They were jealous of Joseph. The reason they were jealous is because he had something they didn't have. And they knew it. And he was a visionary. He was prophet. And Joseph was used by the hand of God. But there's something about the character of Joseph that rises above his brethren, far above them. And we find that in chapter number 45 and verse 15 of Genesis. The Bible said, Moreover, he kissed all of his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. You see, Justice and might have called for one thing. And that which is right might have called for something. But it was the heart of Joseph that began to speak to his brethren. This is how God speaks to us through his heart. Amen. You can follow the law all you want to and think the law is going to save you, keep the commandments and do all of that, but you'll end up with frustration and deceit and lying to yourself. The only salvation there is is through mercy and grace offered at the cross. He loved them. He kissed them, and he kissed his brethren. Now, there's something odd about the Jewish people, and a lot of people today have a hard time accepting this. But the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 7 and verse 6, For thou art and holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. And above all people that are upon the face of the earth, the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you. Let's stop right there. This is a sovereign God. He chooses to love. He doesn't love you because there's anything lovable about you. Real love is not like that. Real love is not looking for something to satisfy it. Real love casts itself upon one who is unlovable. And the Lord chose you to love you. Now, you didn't say that about any other nation, about the Jews. This is why they're blinded right now. Go read Romans 11. You'll find some great truths revealed in it. They're blinded. They gave you the Bible. We are indebted right now to the Jews for the Tanakh, Genesis through Malachi. We're, to, we're indebted to them. We owe them. You say, how close is our Bible to their Bible? Exact. Yeah. Word for word. Word for word. Their Bible is our Bible. But they don't have the New Testament. The reason they don't have the New Testament because they don't have the New Covenant yeah. of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they'll get that when he shows up and they see the nail prints in his hands and they'll say, where did you get these? He said, I got him in the house of my friends. Boy, they'll mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only son. In other words, they've lost their inheritance, the only son, the firstborn, the only one. They've lost it all, but he loves them. He loves them. Do you love? Do you have the capacity to love? That's a good question, don't you think? If uh, somebody doesn't deserve it, do you still love them? If your marriage is rocky and shaky tonight do you think love can pull it out oh yeah you better believe it can love can cover a multitude of sins the bible says love is stronger than death that's what it says in the song of solomon love is a powerful thing then there's the kiss of gratitude this is a beautiful picture in the bible in second samuel chapter 16 verse 13 david and his men went by the way David is, a, David is fleeing now from Abishalom, Absalom, father of peace. And he wants to take over his father's throne. And so David, his men went by the way. Shammai went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. Who is Shammai? Shammai is the house of Saul. When David became the king of Israel, he was anointed by Samuel. And Saul was anointed by Samuel. But you see, Saul was the choice of the people. David was the God's choice. And so the house of Saul, because God, he didn't obey what the Lord told him to do, he said, I'm going to take it from you, and I'm going to give it to a man that will serve me and obey me. And he did. He gave it to David. But Saul's family despised David because the throne had been passed from Saul to David. And so we find Shammai using the occasion to curse him and cast rocks upon him and everything he could possibly do to show his hatred for David. But then in 2 Samuel chapter number 17, verse 27, 
We read it came to pass when David was come to Mahinam. You remember Mahinam? That Shobi, the son of Nahash, of Rabbah, the children of Ammon, and Maker, the son of Amiel, of Lodibar. You remember Lodibar? And Barzillai, the Gileadite, of Rogelim, brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and flour and parched corn and beans and lentils and parched pulse. If you want to know what people ate 3,000 years ago, just read that. <laughs> 2 Samuel 17, verse 29, And honey and butter and sheep and cheese of kind for David and for the people that were with him to eat. For they said, The people is hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. So one curses him and another befriends him. Barzillai was an old man, but he loved David. And he came to his aid. He brought all this food and all, this, all the things that he would need. In 2 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 39, when David came back to Jerusalem, and he would, he would. Absalom cannot keep it. Absalom died an odd death, if you read the Bible. I mean, his long hair got him in trouble. <laughs> so what happened to him, preacher? He was dry. He was riding under an oak tree, and his hair got caught in it, and there he hung. And then Joab found about it, and you know what Joab had done. You know, the Bible's quite a book. You read these stories in there, you'll see hatred. You'll see everything under the sun, deceit, malice. You'll find trickery. And so the Bible says that in chapter number 19 and verse 39, the people went over Jordan, and when the king was come over, he kissed Barzillai and blessed him and returned him unto his own place. And from that day on, Barzillai never wanted for anything. The king took care of him because he befriended him. The old man. Seems like he was wise, doesn't it? The old man befriended David. And David remembered. He remembered who his friend was. When he was down and out. When he was down. When the wolves appear at the door. When the pack comes after you. Note him. You don't judge a tree by the Babel. Babel's cheap. How long did it take you to learn how cheap talk is? Cheapest thing you ever saw in your life. It's not even worth the wind it takes to put it out. It's the cheapest thing in the world. Talk, talk. You know a tree by the fruit it bears. The fruit it bears. And Barzillai showed the fruit. When David, of course, is a type of Christ... He's one of the great types of Christ in the Bible. He's a type of Christ, the warrior. Joseph is a type of Christ, the sufferer. In different types of Christ we find the Bible. And David did not forget who his friends were. Barzillai was his friend. Are you a friend of Christ? You know what the Bible says about Abraham? He was the friend of God. That's quite a thing. Abraham was different. You know what the Lord said about Abraham? He said, I know him. He'll direct his house. Do you direct your house? Is the Lord in your house or is he only here? Do you, leave it, do you leave him behind when you walk out the back door? Say, Lord, I'll see you later. When I come back, why, we'll get back together again. Or do you take him with you? The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 24 and verse number 49, this is the kiss of betrayal. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 49. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Now, who's this? Yeah, Judas, the man of Kirath, Judas Ishkirath. You remember talking about him this morning? All the disciples were Galileans except him. And I, I've looked on the Bible to try and find you, Kirath, and it's hard to find. It's almost like it doesn't exist anymore. It's almost like everything that had to do with his memory has just been wiped away. And the only thing that has anything to do with Judas is the Bible, which will never be wiped away. For it's forever settled in heaven. You know what he did? He presented himself as a friend. He stood up and he kissed him. And he, by doing that, was showing no appreciation or respect for what that really meant. What he was doing, everything that Judas Iscariot did that night was for Judas Iscariot. 
we have a lot of folks today, the liberal theologians, come along and try to redeem Judas and say that he was, well, he had a greater motive in mind. He was trying to get the Lord to reveal himself, and so they would begin to throw off the yoke of Rome, and he could really get his people behind him and all of this. No, 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 no. The Bible said Judas was a devil. You can't change his motive. He was a devil. But I want you to compare Judas with this one. Luke chapter number 7 and verse number 45. The Lord said, Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. Now Judas, is, his name is recorded for all posterity. And he didn't bow down. He just reached over and kissed him. This woman wasn't worthy to rise up before him. She stayed down on her knees and she kissed his feet. She came before him in love and respect. You see, the Bible says, to whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. I'm not telling you to go out and sin, but I'm telling you this. If you've had a pile of sins forgiven, you should have a great love for Christ tonight. If you lived a wicked, godless life, you say, well, these aren't nice people. I'm not, I'm not interested in nice people. That's what's killed the church. Good people. I don't care anything about good people. I want redeemed people Amen. where God gets the glory. God gets the glory. She, no doubt, I don't know what she did. I don't know what she did before, but I know one thing. She was forgiven, and she loved him. To whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. I firmly believe tonight some of the best preachers I've ever heard in my life were some of the sorriest dogs that ever lived. Amen. Low down. I mean to tell you, Oliver Green, you ever heard of him? Oliver Green, J. Harold Smith, uh, uh, Brother Sattler, what's his name? Harold Sattler. I hadn't been saved two days until I found them. <laughs> and I started listening from that moment on. Well, Oliver Green was a black sheep in his family. He was a sorry, low-down piece of garbage until he got saved. And once he got saved, you ever hear him preach? Now, he teaches on radio. He teaches on the radio. But he's called from that old-timey type preaching. And I'm telling you, I heard him one time. And I thought, is that Oliver Green? And I mean to tell you right now, he was preaching the Word of God. I loved him then and love him now, and J. Harold Smith and Harold Seitler and all them. Oh, I loved them. I listened to them. I still listen to them. And they, they fed my soul. These were men of God. So my I want to tell you something. You might be, the, you might be the, the, the black sheep in your family. You might be the outcast of all the rest of them. You might be the one that ever, all your family said you'll never amount to a hill of beans. That's the worst thing in the world, tell somebody. That's awful. Talk to them like that. But God can take the lowest and make the greatest out of you. No telling what God can do. Amen. Amen. So this woman kissed his feet. She wiped them with her hair. Her hair is her glory. Did you know that? Did you know that a woman's hair is her glory? That's what it says. And it gives you a mystery in it too. And it says that a woman's hair is her glory. And a woman wears her hair, her glory, into the church house because of the angels. Now go figure that one out. <laughs> that's what the Bible says. The Bible has, his, has mysteries in it that just aren't apparent right off the bat. Do you believe it? I believe it. Do you understand all of it? No, I don't understand all of it. But I believe it. A woman's hair is her glory. So she kissed his feet and used her hair. But finally, in the book of Luke chapter 15, verse number 20, he arose and came to his father. He knew where to go. He knew what to do. And when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran. I like that, don't you? Amen. You take a step toward God, he'll take ten toward you. Amen. <laughs> he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This is something about reconciliation. Who did the reconciling? God did. The boy was simply obedient to it. He was drawn by the Holy Ghost to come back to his father. I'll be a servant in his house, he said. 
Just make me one of your hired servants. That's good. You can't be a hired servant. You're my son. That'll never change. Sonhood is forever. We sit at the table of God, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. We don't sit there as slaves. We sit there as sons. We are sons of God by the new birth. He's my father. Can't be taken away from me. You can run me off and excommunicate me and, and, and say whatever you want to, but you can't change my sonship. That can't be changed. I'm a son by the new birth. So how do you know you are? Because somebody moved inside me that was much greater than I am, and he changed me from what I was to a new creature in Christ Jesus. And you can't take that away from me. That's one of those things that you either know or you don't know. I hope you know it. I hope you understand that what we're talking about tonight, our faith, is not a bunch of intellectual assent to a bunch of doctrines, you know, things that you believe where somebody's confirmed you or laid hands on you and pronounced you a Christian. No. What I believe I learned up here, but it moved in here. And it's in my heart the man believeth unto righteousness. And with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. From the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. You speak what you believe. Because you, re you, you love him and you accept him. So he fell on his neck and kissed him. Have you ever been kind of cold on God and drifted away from him? That's mostly what happens to Christians. It really is. They just kind of drift around a little bit and they drift off here and they drift off there. I mean, you don't really get into a bunch of bad stuff, although you can. Usually it's just drifting away and you're not praying and reading your Bible and and you know that you're not walking in fellowship with the Lord. And it kind of starts working on you after a while. And you think to yourself, what in the world am I doing? I don't have to eat husk with the hogs. Look at these people I've been running around with. That's all they know. That's what they live for. Are you following me? They just want to party and get drunk and they want to do this. And I know better than that. And have you ever felt that way? You said, you know something, <laughs> Even when I was in my father's house, it was much better than this. Much better than this. I will arise. I'm done with it. I've had enough of it. And I'll go back to my father. And I'll say, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. Just take me into your house and make me as one of your hired servants. My father said, Son, that was settled at Calvary. You're my son and you will be forever. And he drew him in and he ran and kissed him. And I would that you'd do that tonight. I would that you would. Have you drifted off? Have you drifted out where you know you shouldn't be? You're watching stuff you ought to be watching. Listening to things you shouldn't be listening. When New Year's showed up, I remember uh, 40, whew, nearly 50 years ago, I guess, they had, a, they had the mayor's ball here in Knoxville the mayor's ball for New, New Year's. I got me a tuxedo, buddy, and we went into the mayor's ball, and we got us a bottle of liquor, and I went in there, and I sat down, and boy, we had us a time in the mayor's ball. Kyle Testerman was the mayor back then. How many been around here long enough to know who, who I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's what I used to be. That's what I used to be. Did you know I haven't had a drink of liquor now in, <laughs> since 1973? <laughs> Some of you look sour tonight. <laughs> Here's what I'm trying to say to you. I thought that was a big deal. Yeah. New Year's, you know, all that partying and all of that. Well, this is a big deal. You know what I did this year at New Year's? I pulled the covers up about 10 o'clock that night, and <laughs> rolled over and went to sleep, got up the next morning, no hangover, nothing. Slept good through that night. And then I got up the next morning. I said, welcome 2022. Amen. It's just another year with the Lord. See, this is what I thank God for tonight. There's no yearning. There's no desire. There's no pulling. Are you listening? There, there's, not, there's nothing inside me that says, look what you're missing. Look what you're missing out on. Nothing. This, that's not there. There's just something inside me that said, I love you. Oh, how you've changed me. I'm not what I used to be. And I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have changed me. Lord, have mercy if you only knew. I couldn't change me, but God changed me. And he changed me from what I was.
to who I am tonight, and I'll give him glory until I draw my last breath on this earth. Amen. And I'm telling you, folks, this is important for you to understand. There's no struggle. I'm not, I don't, I don't want to go back to that. Go back. I don't want to go back. I don't want any part of it. I'm done with it. There's a place over there on Central Avenue Pike I used to go to. <clears throat> we won't get into all kinds of names tonight. <laughs> but it was one of my old haunts. And I drove by after I got saved, and I looked over at that place, and I said, you'll never see me again in there. I'm done with you. <laughs> done with you. <laughs> I'm finished. I'm done with you. Praise God. I had never in my life, in the 27 years before I got saved, had ever had a life like I got when I got on my knees and said, Lord, have mercy on my soul and save me. That changed me, and he gave me something that I rejoice in. Yeah. And I do tonight. Amen. And I praise his holy name. Yeah. Father, bless your word. I pray for all the souls in the house tonight. If they're here and they don't know you, oh, how. You do the same with them as you did with your son. Let them take a step, and you'll take ten. Let them just make an effort to come to you, and you'll meet them. You'll be there for them. We have a Christian tonight, drifted away, just kind of drift. They're not wicked and vile, and they know that. But they're not where they ought to be either. They've drifted. They don't have the joy. The joy's gone. They know it's gone. They can get excited about this and excited about that, Lord, but that's not joy. I pray for them. I pray they'd come home tonight. Come home. Come home. In Jesus' name. Let's sing, brother. Stand up and sing. What have you got? 390.